I'm so pleased to welcome Barbara Perry to discuss her new book, Rose Kennedy, The Life and Times of a Political Matriarch. Ms. Perry is a senior fellow in the Presidential Oral History Program at the University of Virginia's Miller Center and is a well-known authority on the Kennedys, a family she has been interested in since she was four and saw future President John F. Kennedy campaigning in 1960 in Lexington, Kentucky. Louisville. <laughs> Louisville. The new book draws largely on the recently released papers of Rose Kennedy herself, which contained everything she had saved in her 104 years of life. Ms. Perry uses these documents to show Rose's ability to represent her family in the political scene after her husband, Joseph Kennedy, became politically unpopular. Even among the many remarkable mothers of presidents, Rose Kennedy stands above the rest, so please help me welcome Ms. Perry to discuss this remarkable woman. Uh, first of all, thank you, Abby, for that very nice introduction. Uh, and also thanks to Politics and Prose for hosting me this evening. Uh, I am a huge fan of the bookstore, even though I live in Charlottesville, Virginia. And I have to say this is my first trip here, but I feel like I've been here many a time because I always watch on C-SPAN. And so this, this event just feels like something that comes into my living room because indeed it does. So thank you again for doing all of this. Um, now, so what we want to do today, and, and Abby's going to drive the the, the uh, computer for me, is that because this book, if you'll turn to the first slide, because this book is more than, than the definitive biography of Rose Kennedy, though I hope it will always be remembered as that, uh, it also is the biography of an image. It's the biography of Rose's image. It's the biography of the Kennedy image as well, because Rose had such an important role in that. So we're going to talk first about images of Rose and then her story as opposed to history, because oftentimes she was overshadowed by the men in her family and in politics and in society and, and in her church. So I wanted this very much to be her story. As Abby said, I went through 250 boxes of her archives that were released by the Kennedy Library. Yes, some people are shaking their heads. It was quite labor intensive, uh, but she did live to be 104 and she seemed to keep everything that passed through her hands. So uh, those were open in 2006 and I went through as many of them as I could. So so this will be Rose speaking in her voice. And because of that, and because I'm a political historian, um, I think I will be able to give you, even, even about the Kennedys, some perhaps new things, or at least new ways of looking at things uh, for you. And then we want to talk certainly about her political contributions, as well as her prodigious philanthropy. Uh, and then a little bit about the private Rose. You know, what did these papers reveal about Rose Kennedy, the private woman behind the public image that she worked so hard to create? And finally, a little bit about her legacy. Okay, so now I want to turn things back to you. Tell me a little bit, or think back if you will, what are your memories, especially if you're my age or older, of Rose Kennedy? What are your memories of her? What are the images that you have in your mind? And while you're thinking about that, I'll just point out some of the images that, that I know that the public has and history has uh, of Rose Kennedy. The first one on the far left is the family in 1937. This is when they first come on the media scene as Joe is getting ready to launch his diplomatic career in, in that time, 1937, and in 38, he would head over to England to become the ambassador to the court of St. James. So this is the first time the family is really portrayed. This is Life Magazine, which would become, as Teddy Kennedy said, the family scrapbook. Life Magazine loved the Kennedys because they were charming. They were photogenic. There were nine of them. There were nine children plus their parents. And I, I say, too, if the Kennedys had been in the era of the reality show, it would have been Joe and Rose plus nine. That would have been their, their hit show. In the middle is Rose at, at her height of her image. This is from 1962, December, at the Capitol Hilton, just down the street here towards the White House. This is the first international awards banquet for research into mental retardation. Rose, at this point, has just been introduced by Ambassador Adlai Stevenson, who has called her the greatest employment agent in Washington, D.C., because at that time, this man, her son, was president, her son Bobby was attorney general, and Teddy, her youngest son, had just been elected to the U.S. Senate. So you can see she is just basking in that glory. And here, one of the saddest days of her life, the burial of her son Jack at Arlington Cemetery. So now we'll move on. 
These are some of my images that I have of Rose after working with her, it seems, for five years. Uh, on the left is the companion photo to the one that I showed you from the 1962 banquet. Once the dinner started, they sat down. Rose was seated at the head table just next to her son, even though his wife, Jackie, the first lady, was there. But no, Rose had the, the uh, ear, if you will, of the president. And I thought this is a particularly symbolic vision of Rose. She has the president's ear. She's feeling very powerful. Powerful, yet she's half hidden behind her glove with all of her jewelry. And the question I put to you is, what is she saying to the president? Having spent these five years with Rose, I would say it could be anything from the sublime, a fine point of public policy about mental retardation, to, I don't want to say ridiculous, but to the trivial, which Rose sometimes focused on. It could even be, dear, your tie is crooked, or dear, you're using the wrong fork. So it could be something rather minor. This is also an image that I have of Rose. In addition to the 250 boxes of her papers that she saved, I also found, thanks to my friend Rob Capon, who's here this evening and to whom the book is dedicated along with his wife Rose, and thanks to so many of my friends and family and colleagues who are here this evening, but we found online this note that Rose wrote in September 1963 to Mrs. Robert McNamara. And she says, thank you for including me in the luncheon for Pr Her Highness Princess Ruth Nesta. The princess was the daughter of Emperor Haile Selassie. Haile Selassie made a very well-publicized trip to Washington in September of 1963. Mrs. Kennedy, Rose Kennedy, served as the official hostess for the state dinner at the White House for Haile Selassie. And you say, well, where was Jacqueline Kennedy? Jacqueline Kennedy, the previous month, had lost her baby, Patrick Bouvier, after two days. He was born prematurely and passed away of a lung ailment. And she was so depressed that the president said, Jackie, you need to get away. Why don't you go to the Mediterranean, take a cruise with your sister, Lee Radswell, and... Aristotle Onassis was also the man with whom she was sailing. So Rose was at the height of her power as the substitute first lady. But Rose also in her life loved to go visit famous homes and then write to all her friends and family on the stationery. So she'd say, here I am at the White House, here I am at Windsor Castle, we'll see one of those shortly. And then up in the far left, what do you think that is? Anybody have a sense of what that is? Do we have any World War II vets here? Close. All right. That's the famous coconut. Remember when Jack Kennedy's PT-109 was sliced in two off the Solomon Islands in August of 43? Um, he was able to save himself and his crew, all but two who perished immediately upon the collision. He swam them to nearby islands and, and evaded the Japanese for a week. And then, because he didn't have anything to ride on, he took a coconut and he got out a service knife and he, saw, he crossed out, he wrote a, a message, an SOS message gave it to friendly Pacific Islanders who delivered it to an Australian coast watcher and that's how he was saved. He comes home and Rose is just thrilled that he's home and safe because she had nightmares about him in combat and he brings the coconut with him and she says, Jack, you must save the coconut. You must save the coconut. It's going to become very important. Nattering Rose, you must save the coconut, save the coconut. And finally he does. He listens to his mother. He encases it in glass. He makes it a paperweight and he takes it all the way to the Oval Office eventually. And this becomes one of the most important mementos of his military careers showing his heroism. So this is Rose's self-image. I wanted to say, well, you have your images of her, I have my images of her. I wanted to show you a little bit about Rose's image. In 1974, she released her autobiography, uh, Times to Remember. My mother gave it to me as a high schooler for the Christmas of 1974. And you'll notice that this is the photograph then that when she passes away in 1995, Life magazine uses of her. This is how she wanted to be known in, by this time, she was in in her early 80s. She was born in 1890 and, as I say, lived until 1995. You'll notice there's a YouTube connection down here. We're In the interest of time, we're going to skip over this. But you can go on YouTube and you can watch Rose Kennedy in a documentary that she did at this time with Robert McNeil of the famous McNeil-Lair Report because she wanted to get the word out about her autobiography. And you can get a real sense of how she wanted us to know her uh, by this time again in the early 1970s. So we'll, we'll move on. 
How did she become this figure, this almost magical image and figure that she created? Well, it starts in Boston. She's born in the north end of Boston. We were just there to uh, launch the book uh, last week at the Kennedy Library. We had dinner at a wonderful Italian restaurant in the north end, and I, I dragged my friends Rose and Rob Capon to her birthplace, which was around the corner. And even to this day, it's a tenement. It's an old-fashioned immigrant Irish-American tenement. Rose was just three generations generations removed from the potato famine of the 1840s when the Kennedys and the Fitzgeralds all came to Boston and settled. So this would have been just before the turn of the last century, or as she would say, the lost century. And, and Rose was the oldest of six children. This is Rose the Victorian. Notice the hat, the perfect coat, the perfect gloves, the perfect bow. She, as a young girl, was already becoming this important public image because at this time her dad was already in the U.S. Congress. He was a member of the House of Representatives, the famous John Fitzgerald, for whom Rose named her second son. Uh, he, this was John F. Fitzgerald, also known as Hun Honey Fitz. He'd go on to be the mayor of Boston. And he was indeed mayor of Boston when this photo was taken in 1907. This is Rose, uh, about 16 years of age. She is christening the Bunker Hill in Philadelphia, but because it's named for the famous Bunker Hill battle uh, of her hometown of Boston, she and her father traveled to Philadelphia. And so Rose, from her teenage years, was already on the political stage, and she loved it. She loved to be in the spotlight. So here she is with her father, the mayor, and Rose is now the Gibson girl. This is about 1910. Uh, she's surrounded by her younger siblings, and you're saying, where is Mrs. Fitzgerald? Where is Rose's mother, Josie Fitzgerald? Well, Rose was an interesting combination of the two personalities. Her dad was the, the Teddy Kennedy figure. He was the outgoing, charismatic, loved to be out on the stump, and Rose had that part of her. Look how happy she is. She really is enjoying this parade, this parade political parade in Boston. But she could also be like her mother who was very introverted. And so her mother tended to stay home with the younger children and Rose got to be the substitute political spouse for her dad. And then she meets Joe Kennedy, all right? This is the summer as a teenager that she met him. Rose is here, talk about Victorian, look at that bathing suit, ladies, uh, including stockings. And so she's in a Victorian bathing costume. Here is young Joe Kennedy. Rose is 16. He's two years her elder, and she falls head over heels in love with him. He has beautiful red hair, a beautiful smile. He's an athlete. He's a leader at the Boston Latin School. He's very charismatic like her dad, and she is completely smitten with him. Her dad, however, is not so happy that she wants to marry, eventually, Joseph P. Kennedy because her dad had picked out a bow for her in their neighborhood. And so he sends Rose to a Prussian convent when Rose is in her late teen years, hoping to get her out of Joe Kennedy's hold, but it doesn't work. She comes home in October of 1914. She marries Joseph P. Kennedy, and forevermore, she wanted to be known as Mrs. Joseph P. Kennedy. If you wrote to her, Mrs. Rose Kennedy, she'd write back, please call me Mrs. Joseph P. Kennedy. She was so proud of that. Now, we know that that marriage was fraught with problems, right? We've, I'm sure you've all heard about Gloria Swanson. All right, so this is what happens. Rose and Joe have uh, four children in their first five years of marriage. Very quickly, then, they have two more. They have seven children while they're living in Brookline, just outside of Boston. Joe is beginning to make his millions on Wall Street, unregulated Wall Street, we should say, sort of like now. And he then, um, he then he says, you know, we need to move the family to New York. So they move to uh, a nice suburb of Westchester County, just outside New York City. And he says, yes, I, this is where my work is. So Rose, somewhat reluctantly, gives up her roots in Brookline and Boston, leaves her, her per parental family behind, and they move to New York. She just gets the family settled, seven kids, and Joe says, oh, I'm going to Hollywood. I'm going to be a producer. Off he goes. Rose says, good luck and Godspeed. I'm staying behind. I'm not moving these seven kids again. At that point, they had six kids. She goes to visit him one time in Hollywood and comes back pregnant with Jean Kennedy Smith, I should add. That's her, that's her eighth child. So she then no doubt gets word because this was a very public affair that Joe had with Gloria Swanson. 
How does Rose deal with this? This is another letter we found that's now in my private collection. It says, and this was written to one of her girlfriends from when they were young girls. She writes in the early 1930s, I have had quite an interesting life. My husband was quite successful in the movies, and we went out frequently with Gloria Swanson and other stars. I will tell you all about it when I see you. Now, this is always how Rose dealt with the inconvenient truth. You, you, you say something legitimate and you move on. You know, she didn't go on Oprah and tell all. She didn't in her memoir tell all. This is how she kept up appearances of this perfect marriage, even though others knew otherwise. Now, very soon after she wrote that letter, she's on the world stage now. She's not just the belle of Boston. She's not just the wife of the Wall Street entrepreneur and the Hollywood producer. Now the family does pick up and move to London, pre-war London, 1938, for Joe's ambassadorship. Three weeks after Rose arrives in London, she finds herself spending the weekend at Windsor Castle with the king and queen of England. Imagine what that's like. Here is this Irish Catholic couple two or three generations removed from the potato famine and the coffin ships of the immigrants, and she's now weekending at Windsor Castle. So what does Rose do? She pulls out the stationery, Windsor Castle. She writes to her friends and family. In this case, to another friend, Joe and I are leaving in the morning after a very brilliant weekend. We had Sunday dinner today with the two little princes as well as the king and queen. They are all charming. Now, the princes are... Are. The current Queen Elizabeth was then little Princess Elizabeth and her sister, Princess Margaret. The king was King George VI and the woman who would become the queen mother. She was also Queen Elizabeth. And don't you know, Rose is up there in heaven loving the fact that she now shares her birthday, July 22nd, with a future king of England. This new Prince George has the same birthday as Rose Kennedy. What's new? Some of the reviewers have said, what could you possibly tell us new about this family? Well, I hope you've already learned some new things about the family and Rose. But as a political historian, as a political scientist, what I think about Rose and that I think is a bit of a, of a new glance on her, a new um, approach to her, is that she created this face of Camelot. Really, even before Jackie thought of that word, the week after the president's assassination, that Rose was creating this royal royal American family, because look at them gathered in the embassy in London. Here is Rose on the far left with her tiara, looking very regal. By the way, she had to have it enlarged because the tiara was too small for her head. I'm just saying, could have been her hair, could have been the hairdo. But she had this perfectionistic streak that I think goes back to her Victorianism, but also her response to Catholicism, as well as to the secondary role that she was forced to play in her life. So she thought, okay, I'm secondary, I will just be a perfect secondary. And that creates this family, the nine children, but also notice it's Joe who's the center of gravity. Okay, let me move on. All right, now, when the war ends, and sadly, Rose loses her firstborn, Joe Jr., the apple of her eye, he is killed in a, in a bombing mission when his plane blows up over England. She is devastated, and Joe Sr. is devastated as well. But Rose comes back, and now the mantle, the political mantle, falls to Jack, the second son. And so by 1946, he's out on the political stump running for Congress from Boston. The Kennedys start a new tradition called Kennedy Tees, T-E-A-S. They begin to rent grand ballrooms and grand hotels, first in Boston, then when he runs, in this case in 1952, for the first time as Senate, they now rent ballrooms all over Massachusetts. And they send engraved invitations, usually to the ladies, and the ladies come in their finery and they get their hair done, and thousands of women show up because Jack is not married yet. Remember, he doesn't marry till 1953. So Rose, his mother, said all the young women wanted to marry him, all the older women wanted to nurse him and mother him because he's on crutches because his back is so bad from his war injury. 
And so Rose, the, the, the way they would go through this, Rose would get up to the microphone and she would tell stories about glamorous stories of days in England with the king and queen at Windsor. She now had a whole series of stories to tell on the campaign stump. Then she'd introduce her son. Then she'd introduce one of her daughters. Then they'd form a receiving line and all the ladies would file up and shake hands with the famous Kennedys. This was a huge political success. Anybody remember the person Jack Kennedy defeated in 1952? Henry Cabot Lodge, who said, and I quote, it was those damn tea parties. You know, I might, he didn't win, Kennedy didn't win by a lot, about 70,000 votes. Lodge blamed the tea parties because they were so successful. Now you also may be saying, hmm, I don't see Joe Sr. there. Where is Joe? Joe is politically toxic at this point. Why? Because right before America entered World War II and just as Britain had entered, he says, it, what he thinks is an off-the-record newspaper interview, he says, I think democracy may be finished in England. I think the Nazis might defeat England. I think democracy might be finished in this country, in the U.S. So he's already viewed as an appeaser, of Hitler. He's viewed as an anti-Semite. And now he says these very undiplomatic things. He's politically toxic. He cannot go out on the political stump. I do not in mean to indicate he's not powerful behind the scenes. He's got the money. He's got the strategy. He's got the uh, a way to get the kids into the powerful positions. But it's Rose who's the face of that generation out on the political stump. Now I bring you all the way up to 1980. Here she is with her oldest granddaughter, Kathleen, Bobby's oldest daughter, and a picture of Ted Kennedy and his then wife, Joan, and their three adorable children. Where is Ted? This is 1970. What had happened in 1969? Chappaquiddick. I found in Rose's papers memos from the staff of Ted Kennedy saying, Dear Mrs. Kennedy, and I hope they said Mrs. Joseph P. Kennedy, because if they said Mrs. Rose Kennedy, she wasn't going to be happy. So they said, Dear Mrs. Kennedy, could you please come out and campaign for the senator? Because of what happened last summer. That was their code for Chappaquiddick. Out comes Rose and she campaigns again. This is 1960, okay? This is two decades before. Still no Joe, because Joe's still politically toxic. 1960, this is the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles that year. And so when Jack is nominated and goes over to the arena to accept the nomination, he doesn't take his father. He takes his mother and his sister, Pat Lawford, who, of course, by that time was married to Peter Lawford. They lived in Los Angeles. This is Rose accepting the applause. Notice that kind of regal wave it looks like she's doing. She loved this. So, th as the narrator says at the point, the way to understand Rose, that's the way to understand Rose. That is Rose. That is vintage Rose. She's out on the platform with Bobby, though he says, we rarely go out on the same platform because we're always afraid she will overtake us. She will outshine us. But she'll also be there whispering in our ears. As she came up, she introduces him, and then she goes back and says, then she comes up and says, oh, to be sure to tell them about, we don't even know what she was saying. And he, But the best thing about Bobby is, he plays along with her. He banters with her warmly. What was the, the adjective that was used about Bobby Kennedy when he first ran for Senate from New York in 1964? Ruthless, aggressive, all true, I should say. But he had this, he had this humanity problem. He had this humaneness problem. His mother gave warmth to him. So this bantering on stage with her was absolutely perfect. Made him seem human because everybody's got a mother whispering in their ear. And he took it in good stride and then moved on and said, ah, you know, this is why we don't go on stage typically with my mother. So we'll move on to the next one. So Rose is comfortable in any media setting. From the time she's in the newspapers as a teenager to newsreels when they are in England to television when it comes on the scene. And by the 60s and 70s, remember all these syndicated talk shows that were on in the daytime, some of them, Dinah Shore. Rose prided herself on her musical qualities. She knew piano. And so here she is playing the piano as Dinah sang Sweet Adeline because Sweet Adeline was the campaign theme song of Honey Fitz. And Rose would, would play that till the day she was no longer able to. Here she is with Merv Griffin. She, she got to know Merv Griffin so well that she'd call him up and give him advice. And she'd say, do you know about your religion? He was Catholic, but he wasn't Catholic enough for 
her. So she'd call him up and she'd give him advice about Catholicism. And he once told Ted Kennedy this and he said, oh, you're a Kennedy boy now, Merv, because mother does that to us as well. And then here she is with Mike Douglas. So this is all in the, the late 60s, the early 70s. What is she talking about with these people? First of all, she was so perfectionistic that she'd get the gig and then she would write up a script. She'd write up the questions she wanted the host to ask her. I've done that, by the way, for you all this evening. I will pass around my script so you can ask me the questions I want to hear. But no, she would she'd pass around a script, and, and she'd say, these are the questions I want to be asked. They were about mental retardation. By the early 60s, the Kennedys admit that they have Rosemary, her oldest daughter, who was diagnosed with mental retardation when she was in kindergarten in the mid-1920s. And so you know about, I'm sure, the Kennedy Foundation, which has raised millions of dollars for uh, rental retardation, as well as Eunice Kennedy Shriver and Special Olympics. This is what Rose was talking about as a means of raising millions of dollars. So her daughter's tragedy, in addition to having this sad disability, I'm sure you also know the story of how her father in 1941 and without consulting Rose subjected Rosemary, a young woman at that time, to a lobotomy. And it went badly wrong, and Rosemary was infantilized. So all of the progress the Kennedys had made in mainstreaming her way ahead of the game in terms of mainstreaming. And you'll see here they took her to England. She is right here on her way to Buckingham Palace to be presented to the king and queen. Rose is in the middle, keeping a wary eye on her with the press gathered round, and Rose's other daughter, Kathleen, uh, who sadly was killed in a plane crash in 1948. But... Rosemary was doing really well, but when they came back from England in her early 20s, she began to suffer seizures and depression and anxiety, and Joe Kennedy read the literature on lobotomies, and it, he thought that this would help. It did not. By the mid-1940s, Rosemary was confined to an institution, a Catholic nursing home in Wisconsin, and she stayed there till 2005 when she passed away. So one of Rose's proudest days was the groundbreaking for the Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy Center for Research in Mental Retardation and Human Development with her son, now the senator uh, from New York, uh, and this is the president of Yeshiva University. So Rose, to this day, has the center named for her. It has a slightly different name now. And we also know that this tragic day is looming in Rose's life, November 22, 1963. And despite her very strong Catholic faith, she escaped to the beach at Hyannis Port when she heard the news that her son was gone, murdered on the streets of Dallas, and she just kept asking why. She kept asking God why. Why would he take someone at the height of his powers uh, doing what she thought was good for the country? Her husband by this time is completely stroke-ridden and cannot speak, and so Rose is really left alone. Um, Abby is going to open one last uh, file for us. This is at the Miller Center at the University of Virginia, where I am based, and you're going to see a transcript. It will come up so you can actually see the words, we hope, um, as well as the sound. This is Rose Kennedy being called from Air Force One. Um, she's being called by Lyndon Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson about two hours after President Kennedy's death, and they are expressing their condolences to Rose Kennedy at Hyannis. Listen carefully. I'm sure that virtually all of you uh, can remember what you were doing two hours after hearing that news. 
And for her to be, again, so poised and so directed, she's always the wife of the diplomat. She knows just what to say to the new president. You'll notice the steward who puts the call through from Air Force One as it flies back with her son's remains to, uh, to the Air Force Base here, to Andrews. Um, he says, Mr. Johnson, but it's M Mrs. Kennedy who, who responds, you know, yes, Mr. President. And it's Lady Bird whose voice is cracking with emotion and Rose who's completely together and completely um, poised and knows what to do. But how, how lonely she sounds, it seems to me, when that little voice when she says goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. And she, Rose says in her memoir, who could imagine that five years later, the same thing would happen to her again. She said, if someone wrote this in a novel, if you went to the fiction part of this bookstore and, and read this, you'd say, well, how unbelievable is that? That would never happen. And five years later, it does. So here she is at St. Patrick's Cathedral with the coffin of son Bobby, assassinated after his victory in Los Angeles, for which she had just returned. She had campaigned for him throughout California and done a superb job. Rose said it was her faith that got her through. She thought of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and she said, I just thought of Mary at the cross. Every time Rose was forced to look at the casket, knowing her, one of her dear sons was there, she thought of Mary and how Mary withstood these trials and tribulations, and that's how she did as well. And so while Rose was a very, very powerful Catholic and very staunch, she was human, and so one of the ways she dealt with this tragedy was to leave. She just left the country. And so this is a picture of her in 1964 in the summer of that year on the south of France talking to artist Marc Chagall. And then when she turned 80, she decided to go to Addis Ababa to be with Haile Selassie because when she was at dinner with him in 1963, she discovered they had the same birthday. So she said, okay, I'm going to travel 25,000 miles at age 80, and I'm going to visit. My cousin Kathy, I just have to tell you, was one of President Kennedy's first uh, Peace Corps volunteers and served in Ethiopia for two years. So as a grade schooler, I learned all about Ethiopia when Kathy was there in the Peace Corps. Uh, so Haile Selassie seemed like a real person to me. And this is Rose. She is curtsying to him because she had curtsied at the convent. She was taught by the Mother Superior to curtsy, and she was very proud of that fact. But mostly, she spent her time in church uh, praying to God because she said, I will never allow myself to be vanquished, and it was her faith that helped her not to be. And the last few years of her life before she suffered a debilitating stroke uh, in, her, um, in her early 90s, uh, in the early 1980s, she spent cementing the image of the Kennedy family. The photo here to the left is of John Kennedy's dorm room at Harvard in Winthrop House. It is owned by the John F. Kennedy Institute of Politics at Harvard. Uh, Rose went there in, the, uh, in 1970 to dedicate it to him. It is now refurbished to look as it did, I'm sure slightly neater than when her son was there. Uh, and I had the honor of staying there last year at this time when I was finishing up my research. It is an amazing kind of spiritual uh, experience to be in that room. And then in 1977, she broke ground at Columbia Point in her old neighborhood of Dorchester, just outside of Boston, with her uh, granddaughter Caroline, her grandson John Jr., Teddy, her last surviving son, and Mrs. Onassis here. They're breaking ground for what became the Kennedy Library uh, in, in Boston. And she also spent some of her time refurbishing the house where Jack Kennedy was born in Brookline. She bought the house after her son was assassinated. She meticulously oversaw its refurbishment. She, it, she recorded a tour of the house so that when you go to the house, you can hear her voice tell you about it. And in 1969, in this photograph, she handed the deed of the house back to the American people, back to the American government. So when you go to Brookline, line now. That house is in the hands of the park rangers. And at the time, she pointed up to this window and she said, this is where the future president was born, as well as three of her other children. And she said she would never forget holding her children in, in her arms for the first time. And she said, particularly for the future president, what you do with your child can influence not only him, but everyone he meets, and not for a day or a month or a year, but for time and eternity. And that's how Rose saw her legacy through her children that she affected all eternity through their contributions to our country.
And so I thank you so much for being here this evening and for your attention. I would be happy to sign books that you might purchase this evening, but I'm also happy to attempt to answer any questions that you might have about Mrs. Kennedy or the Kennedy family. So thank you very much.